So I haven't updated things there, um, but it's nothing major. I'll, uh, I'll try to update that right after uh, section. Did I not have a, ooh, I'll fix that link too. I don't have a link there. Um, all right, not on top of it, that's great. So I'll fix the link and then I'll update the code. Um, <clears throat> all right, any general stuff before we get started with arrays? And some other stuff too. I guess the, the overall theme is arrays, but. All right, so yeah, before we get into arrays, we're gonna spend some time on that. Um, I just wanna do a quick review of compiling and that process, um, the debugging process. Hopefully you're getting more comfortable with this as you work on your problem sets um, and so on. So this is pretty much all we're gonna say about compiling. We call it compiling, but in reality that means uh, a whole bunch of different things, right? Compiling is technically only one step. Um, so in order, the first step is called pre-processing. Um, and I'm, I'm making this overly simple, but I, I kind of think of this as a very fancy copy and paste. Um, this is where all of those include things get, you know, turned into real files. Um, so basically the, the program goes through and replaces all of those um, pre-processing directives with the, the hash symbol um, with the actual uh, relevant code. The second step is actually compiling. Um, and this is sort of an intermediate step um, where we're converting our source code into assembly code. Um, you saw an example of that in um, lecture. Hopefully it looks sort of maybe human readable, but not very. Um, it, it's it's very cryptic and is a much lower level language. It's sort of a, you know, a step below the human readable C source code. Um, after we've generated that assembly code, assembling will convert that into machine code or binary, the ones and zeros. And then finally linking is the last step where basically your machine code um, from your program gets combined with things from libraries or external sources uh, and all gets stuck into one uh, program that can then be executed. So this is, you know, sort of a, a complicated process. Um, we talk about it here and then we pretty much ignore it after that. And we just run, you know, make hello or make whatever. Um, and, you know, just have to understand that all this is happening behind the scenes uh, and that, some some pretty smart people came up with some some cool stuff here to let us not have to deal with ones and zeros or assembly code. Um, any were any questions or anything come up when you you know saw this in lecture? Anything you want to talk about here? Okay. Um, so debugging. Hopefully you've got some experience with this. I know I have plenty on a daily basis. Um, it's simple conceptually. Write some code, then test it. Um, did it do what it was supposed to do? If it did, that's great. Or you know, go back and try some other tests and maybe you're done once you decide you've run enough tests. Um, if it did not work, the goal is to make a change to something and then you know restart the cycle. And uh, I can tell you this cycle can last a very long time. Uh, I've actually just spent the last three hours trying to debug a problem and haven't fixed it yet. So, uh, you know, hopefully you don't have to spend that long and we can identify the problems uh, relatively quickly. So the best tools for this, um, you know, we give you this tool help 50 um, that can try to sort of convert some of the errors that you might encounter in your program into some more understandable text. Um, it doesn't know everything and it can't help with every problem. Um, my favorite debugging tool is the print command or print F in C. Um, basically, if, if I you know, need to check on things, I usually just put some print statements in my code, you know, uh, 
print something, when I go into a loop, print something, when I'm out of a loop, make sure I'm accessing it. Um, you know, anything like that, just to sort of help yourself know what's happening, where you are, things like that. And a lot of times this lets you sort of see maybe some, you know, assumption that you made didn't work out or, or you know, you didn't structure something quite correctly and this will let you see what's going on. Um, style 50, important, just it's not really a debugging tool, but code becomes much easier to read, um, you know, when it is styled well and, um, you know, having to work with other people's code a lot, I can, I can say when it's sort of messy and, and not, you know, formatted well, it makes it hard for someone like me to help. So if you're asking for help, uh, do run style 50 and check that. Um, pen and paper is great. Uh, you know, just try to outline what I think should be happening and, and try to like reason it out that way. Sometimes it just helps me think. And, um, sorry. Um, there's also the rubber duck that we talked to. I don't know if we'll be able to get you any rubber ducks, CS50 rubber ducks, but there is this idea of just sort of talking to yourself, just speak out loud. And sometimes when you do that, it uh, helps a lot too. Um, there is the other tool called debug 50, and I didn't list it here. Um, but once we, you know, go into this, we can actually play around with it a little. Hopefully you, uh, maybe you've had a chance to play with it. Um, the idea is we can set a, what's called a break point, um, by, you know, if we hover over the, the outside of this, we can click here and set a break point. And then when we run our code with, you know, debug 50 in front of it, it'll stop and let us actually step through the code and see what's happening. Um, so that's also a very useful tool um, lets you see some interesting things. And I know I talked about this a little bit. Um, I talked about it last week. If you were here with me, if you weren't, I just wanted to review sort of things like this because as we move into arrays, um, you know, we're talking about arrays of different types and it can be important to know sort of how big those different types are in, in your computer. And, you know, having this information is actually what makes arrays so efficient. Um, all of the data in arrays are back to back in memory and we can jump around to any position we want because we know that if we have an array of integers, the next number is, you know, jump ahead four bytes, then the following jump ahead four bytes, all over that again. So within C, these are probably the types we'll see. Uh, int, you'll see that a lot. Uh, floats, you'll see chars, hopefully you're working with, uh, this week. Um, we have bools and strings and string is technically unique to CS50. Um, and we will start to unpack that, uh, a little bit this week. So on to the fun stuff with arrays. Um, anytime you're going to initialize array, an array, it's, it's very much like initializing some other type of variable. Uh, we have to feed it a type. We get to name the variable, or in this case, the array. And then we use the square bracket notation to you know, tell our code this is going to be an array. Um, there are a couple ways to do this. One would be to put a size value inside of it. So if I said, you know, int my array five, that's going to give me an array with space for five integers. So five times four bytes, uh, so 20 bytes, it's gonna give me just enough space for five. Um, you can also give an array explicit values. Um, somewhat confusingly, you can say an int my array and then square brackets, but empty. And then in curly braces here, you can actually put the values in. So in this case, zero, one, two, three, four. And in this case, if you're giving it explicit values, you don't need a size because it knows, you know, you have five things here. So it's gonna plug that in and, and fill it in for you. And then somewhat strangely, you can't mix and match these. Um, if you have what's called a variable length array, which literally just means you use a variable to define the length of it, you can't actually set the values. Um, 
I'm not really sure what this is, if this is something done to protect yourself, if it's just sort of a design choice of the language. Um, but you'll see this when we have uh, you know, an array that we, maybe we don't know the size. Um, it would be nice to make sure that, you know, for instance, we had an array that was uh, cleared out, maybe initialized all to zero. Uh, and that's not easy to do in one line, unfortunately, in C. So we'll take a look at that and some things that could possibly go wrong uh, there. Um, questions on just sort of arrays and getting them set up? Or just interrupt me or ask some questions in the chat or something. I feel like it's kind of quiet tonight, or this morning for you, sorry. All right. So once we have an array, the sort of space for a whole bunch of information, um, the way we access the individual values is again using square brackets. So if I've initialized you know, my array and filled it with 98765, um, I can access the individual numbers here by saying my array bracket zero, and this would give me the number nine. Um, my array bracket four, so zero, one, two, three, four would give me the last value, uh, in this case, the number five. But what if I do something like my array bracket five and sort of go beyond uh, the edges here? Um, this is something that C doesn't stop you from doing. Um, you know, it just trusts you to know what you're doing and uh, does that. So yeah, someone in the, the chat, a couple of people here said like the backslash zero or null. Um, if it's an integer array, we don't know what's out here. So for strings, and we'll talk about that in a minute, that's true. There would be a backslash zero here, the null character. But we honestly have no clue what's going on. So here's a little program, um, sum0.c that I have here. Basically, what, I, what I'm doing in this program is um, taking a and basically making a, an array that is 20 integers long. It's way too big. Uh, I'm putting five values in it and then just looping through the entire array to sum up the values, right? So, you know, this is kind of stupid. Normally, if I were just had five values, I should say it's five, but I'm going to, to 20 here. Um, and so if I make some zero and oops, I'm not in the right directory, so section, section two. All right. And now make some zero. And basically, I'm adding, and then I'm going to print out the value that's there. Um, so if I run dot slash sum oh, zero, um, you can see as I put it in here, I see one, 10, 5, 12, 3. And then luckily for me, I see a whole bunch of zeros after this. Um, I basically just lucked out when, you know, this program ran and it gave me space for 20 integers. It just happened to give me memory that was empty. This is not necessarily true. Um, you know, we could maybe go beyond this and go another 20 beyond this and let's make it and run it. And you'll actually see if I keep going beyond that array, I'm getting sort of random numbers. I'm basically touching bits of memory in the computer that don't belong to me necessarily. Um, they could have other stuff in them. They could be numbers. They could be letters. They could be anything. We don't know. So you know, this just shows you have to be really careful about what's going on. Uh, you know, when you're accessing all of these things here. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, let's call it a problem with C. Um, maybe not a problem, it's, it's designed that way, but some other languages that we'll tackle uh, make it a little easier to, to not do this to yourself. All right, so yeah, we just touched a little bit on strings with the comment. Um, but as we saw in C, strings don't really exist. They're really arrays of characters or chars. Um, and even that is still a little bit 
of a simplification. We're going to learn a little bit more about what these actually are uh, in some upcoming uh, lectures. But for now, let's, let's just sort of throw that aside and talk about strings being these character arrays. So as was mentioned, uh, you know, string s being hello, h-e-l-l-o, and this string uh, keyword here tells it after it's done, we're going to put backslash zero or the null character. Uh, this is basically just all zeros uh, in binary. So just like we could do this with an array of integers, we can go through this and look at them. If I wanted to print uh, s bracket one, that would give us this e character, zero, one. Uh, s bracket five, zero, one, two, three, four, five. Um, so in this case, I have sort of gone beyond the length of my word here. So this, you know, uh, zero, one, two, three, four, and I'm going beyond it. But because it's a string, this backslash zero is going to actually be printed out. Um, turns out it may not show up on your screen as anything. It's just sort of empty space, but it's still there. Um, and again, I can go beyond this and start touching things outside of this array. And um, we could take a look at that too. So very similarly, um, I have a uh, program here that takes in a string, um, loops through that string, printing out a single character at a time. So it's a very, you know, not not very interesting way to print something. I could technically use percent %s and print the whole thing, but um, this lets us see what's happening, um, you know, with, behind the scenes here. So if I make string and run dot slash string, right now I'm going through the length of the string plus one. Um, and you'll see it looks like just hello, H-E-L-L-O. If I highlight it though, there is an extra character here at the end, that null character. Um, it's just not a printable character. So it just shows up as a empty space. Um, so that's great. Um, but you know, what happens if we start going beyond that? We can go a hundred characters past it. Um, so if I make it and run dot slash string, you can actually see I'm getting into, I have no idea, hello, percent C, some random characters. Again, we can keep going out and out and touching bits of memory that aren't, you know, don't belong to us or our program. Um, you can see I might actually be getting into, I have no idea what this is. You know, I've got a stuff that almost looks like it might be the start of my, my code or something like that. I don't think it is, but. Um, yeah, so there's still a whole lot of stuff in here, right? Um, so still be careful. You can check, check that, uh, and see what's going on. Um, one thing I just wanted to go over because it might help with, um, the assignment was this idea of, um, printing something in reverse. Um, so when we loop through things, um, we generally do this int i equals zero, i less than length, i plus plus, um, and that's perfectly fine. Just, you know, I, I found it easier when I was going through and doing, um, I think it was the, the, the bulbs problem, um, that I actually wanted to start at the high end and count down. So I actually would initialize i to some number greater than zero. And then say, well, you know, i is greater than or equal to zero, i minus minus. And this basically lets me fill an array um, from right to left. You can do the same thing with math here. Um, you know, in this case, I'm doing the length of the array minus one, my, minus i minus one to get to that last thing here. Um, but for right now, I'm going to comment that one out and go backwards. and um, make this program. And if we do this, I can uh, put any text I want in here. And all I'm doing here is I'm uh, printing out the array at each step. Um, I've basically set 
a character array here with uh, the length of my string, whatever the text I input is, and I'm adding one for that null terminator. Because I now have an empty array, I can't guarantee what's in there. So I'm using this, this function called memset. It's in string.h. Uh, and basically what I'm doing is just filling my character array with underscores. And that's basically just, just when I print it out, it shows you the whole array. Right. Um, then at the very end of the array, I'm, I'm putting that backslash zero because if I put it into a, a char array like this, I don't necessarily have this um, when I'm you know, building it from scratch. And then I'm looping through and adding the values from right to left. Uh, and then using this little print array function that just basically prints out a whole bunch of white space so that it lines up with the text that I typed in here and then loops through the string, um, the array actually. So one interesting thing that you can do if you have a character array, a string, is you can do a while loop that says basically while the character is not equal to the null character, keep going through and printing. Um, so this is just a nice thing that you can do. This is you know how Sterling works. This is how a lot of other things with excuse me with strings can be done under the hood. You can basically just do stuff and watch for this special backslash zero, and uh, you know keep going until you hit the end that way. So this is a really nice way. This does in fact protect you from going too far beyond the string if that's something you need to worry about. Pause for a second. Questions, concerns, anything that came up in lecture? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so memset is, is a function that actually just sets memory, uh, sets a value in memory. Um, and the only way I knew that is I actually, you know, did some Googling and looked it up of like how to fill an array with something. So in string.h, there's actually, oh, it's not in here. Um, yeah, there's a lot more if you turn that uh, more comfortable off. So if we look at, String dot h somewhere down here. Wow, there's um, all this stuff to do things with the memory, and all this does, as you can see from this here, is fills the memory with a constant byte. So uh, what I'm doing in this case is I'm taking the single byte sized character of the underscore, and just saying this empty array that I created set every value in this array to underscore. So I'm saying set the memory of array, fill it with this value, and how many times should it do it? Well, it should do it the length number of times. Yeah. So I could have just done a for loop here and just said like for, you know, i equals zero, i less than length, you know, set that value to underscore, but this is just a little shorter. All right. Um, so we mostly spent time talking about what I would call a one-dimensional array, like a string where you get uh, Everything is sort of nicely in one line. Um, but as we go into you know, more complicated things, we can actually go into multiple dimensions of an array. And you know, this often sounds worse than it is. Um, if I just have an array of strings, for instance, and fill it with uh, apple, grape, orange, pear, um, 
I can actually access, you know, just like an array, I'm going to access the individual strings. In this case, fruits bracket two, zero, one, two gets me the word or the string orange. Um, and now that itself is technically another array. So I can actually, you know, get that value and then access its first, really its second character, the letter R, this way. So, you know, stuff to think about when you're maybe um, taking in command line arguments, um, things like that. You're, you're going to get an array of strings, and then you're going to need to do things with them. So you can access them uh, like this. You could technically have even further nested arrays. You could have three-dimensional, four-dimensional, things like that. And you could just keep going and going and going if you needed to. And functions, we're going to be a bit of a review here, hopefully. Um, hopefully, you know a little bit more about what they mean now. Um, you know, and we'll, we'll sort of build on that. So declaring a function, you give a return type here, an int, uh, a bool, a void, even if it's nothing. Um, so return type, then the function name, and then you have to pass in arguments to that function. Um, so now, hopefully, we're, we're getting a better understanding of this int main void. Uh, void is just a special keyword for nothing in C. So this is just saying I have a function called main that takes no input and returns an integer value. Um, so you know, if you did the credit uh, problem maybe in the in the last, you might have made a, a function like I did when I solved it um, that you know did a uh, check for that LUN algorithm. Uh, in this case, you know the one I wrote um, returned a true or false value. Basically, if it passed the the test, it returned true. If it didn't, it returned false. And in this case, I took in a, a long uh, integer, basically a, a more bytes for an integer, as the credit card number. Um, and now, sort of, we've seen. Uh, a way that we can get input from the user from the command line. And you know, this is going to be sort of our new, uh, you know, if this was our first magical incantation in main void, this is our second one. Um, so pretty much, you know, those are your two choices and don't don't mess with them. Um, but in this case, we have our main function, it's still returning an integer. Um, arg c is an integer. That is going to be the argument count, basically how many things were typed in at the command line. And the argv is an argument vector, um, sort of annoying term for me, but that's OK. Um, basically, this means it's just going to be an array of the different arguments from the command line. So if you're running things from the command line, um, a little bit strangely, the first uh, value in argv is always going to be the program's name or what you ran, you know, dot slash whatever. Um, anything after that is going to be, you know, numbered one, two, three, on onward and onward. Um, so, just a a quick program here that basically creates a very simple calculator from the command line. Um, this is sum one dot C. In this case, I have int main int arg C, string arg V brackets, so this array of strings. Um, I have a value called sum that I'm initializing to zero. And now I'm just going to loop through all of the arguments. Um, different than you know, what we might do normally. Uh, in my for loop here, I'm actually starting int i at 1. Uh, and this is very purposely because I know that my first, the zeroth uh, thing in argv is going to be my program's name. So I'm saying, you know, from that first useful value uh, up until we get to the end of the, the number of arguments, we're going to loop through and we're going to add 
the value from argv bracket i. Um, and I'm using this function here, a, a to i, um, that you'll probably might want to use in your stuff here. Um, it's a kind of a funny name for it, but it converts a, a, a string, actually a character, uh, to an integer value. So this only works on one character at a time. Um, we can't do it on like, you know, the number, like, uh, so I guess, yeah, so this does work on like a whole thing here. So this does um, convert ASCII to an integer and, and adds it up. So um, we can run this here. Uh, let's do this, make someone. If I just run, so I didn't do anything to check. I didn't do anything to protect myself. So if I just run it with nothing, it's going to not do any of this and just give me zero. So I could probably write a check, um, you know, and put in some things here, you know, if, um, so what I want to say, if, if arg c, uh, if it's, you know, only one, then maybe I should just print, uh, you know, something to tell the, user what's going on and then i can return a non-zero exit code in this case i'm just going to return one so if i make it again and run it now it says at least one number required and again as i, I think i showed one of the previous last time um and as you saw in lecture we can uh type in this command echo dollar sign question mark um and we can actually see what the return code was um that's you know can be useful if we had different errors we may want to give them different numbers things like that um to help us differentiate but uh if i want to run this for real i can run you know one two three and actually get some six and i can do as many as i want uh here and you know it also, um, interestingly, if I type in just random stuff, um, A to I, which I'm sorry, it does take in the whole thing at once. Uh, some of the other ones don't, they only take one character at a time, but A to I does take in the whole thing at once. Um, it very nicely rejects anything that can't um, be converted. So in this case, it saw my one, two, three, and 40, but ignored all of these things with text. It just doesn't return anything useful for them. I think it returns zero uh, if that happens. So, you know, I'm not checking that uh, the users are supplying integers, like nice numbers to me, but, uh, you know, it sort of takes care of it. Um, the one thing I guess it doesn't take care of is if I try to put, uh, you know, a floating point value in there, it's going to ignore it because I have, you know, declared uh, this as an integer. I'm using a to i, which is integer. If I wanted to add support for this, there's a different function a to f, which sort of makes sense. This is ASCII to float. And I could just convert this over to a float. Uh, percent f and i think that works um all right and so now it's giving me you know a better answer i could probably go through and try to clean this up and you know make it not print out all these extra random zeros but uh good enough you know it's getting there questions here Uh, Mr. Josh. Yes. Okay. Um, you mentioned that we, uh, is it a function, A to F, A to I? Is it a function in which library? Because it's a new for me, uh, honestly. Yep. 
And I it, see that when you so right try here, it, it's so useful. Yep. So this is in the, the it's called standard library, standard lib or std lib. Um, so this is where that is, is from. Um, same thing with A to F. And I'll just update this. Uh, just because that's in there too. And it, it can be useful. Yeah, very useful. Um, and it's simple. Yep. I like things that are simple. Yeah. <laughs> um, it makes life a little bit easier. And you'll see, you know, in other languages, you know, we don't have to worry about any of this. We can just like call, I, I, you know, convert it very easily. And you know. uh, yeah, uh, and I I really hear that your comment is to convert string to integer, but yes. we don't. Uh, this program doesn't need the user to prompt the string because you put number. Um. So it turns out that everything that comes in. At, let's do this. Um, I'm going to copy paste so I don't mess this up. Um, so let's just do parentheses. Uh, I get zero, I less than argc. Uh, I plus plus. Um, I'll leave that for a second. All right. So what I can do, um, you know, let's just do it this way. I can say like percent I um, and do this and try to do make test. Oh, so I didn't do CS50, sorry. Try again, make test. So it's telling me here that if I try to print this out as an integer, format specifies type int, but the argument has type string. Uh, and so we're declaring the, the argument vector, all the command line arguments as strings. And this is very common. Um, basically, we you can't, uh, I can't guarantee that the user is going to type, you know, a number in the command line. And if we look at argv zero, um, if I do this, um, Let me put a new line in there. The very first thing, the zeroth item in the list is the name of the program itself. So basically you're typing in, you know, string, basically characters at the command prompt. So that's how it's treated. Um, you know, we can mix and match uh, different data types and it doesn't know what they are. So it's just going to treat everything as a string until you tell it, you know, what to do with these. Excuse me. Other questions, anything else that's come up using this command line uh, syntax? Thank you, Mr. Josh. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It is. And we will talk about this in in a in a week or two. I don't remember the Mm-hmm. So we'll talk about it. I think in week four. So yes, in, in reality, it's actually 
it should actually be like like this. Um, but this is very confusing for now. Um, if, and this is this is something called basically it's dealing with pointers. They're called and it's going to be one of the more confusing concepts that we have to tackle in this class. I will tell you that for sure. So that's why, you know, in the beginning, especially we, we just call it a string and don't get into anything. And then here we're saying, well, a strings actually an array of characters. And then we'll learn that like, well, it's not really even that it's actually um, the address in memory of a place where you're going to store this stuff. So preview of what's ahead. That's not maybe the best way to explain it, but we'll get to it soon. But yes, if, if you are looking stuff up online and you see char star like this, either like this or the spacing doesn't matter. Um, so you'll see it both ways. This is the exact same thing as string. And if I go back to my error message here that came out, format specifies type int, but the argument has type string, aka char star. Yeah. So it's basically just a replacement. Um, and the one other thing I wanted to touch on, I'm not sure we've done it explicitly in classes, is, is uh, variable scope. Um, just because I've noticed that um, we're using some things in in some of the examples where there's like global variables. We talked about global variables, um, things like that. So the idea is with in in C, um, variables only exist. You can think of it within their curly braces. Um, there's you know, exceptions to this, and we'll again talk about how to get around this in interesting ways. But for the most part, that's the, that's the rule. Um, there are these global variables that exist. You can think of them sort of outside of the curly braces. And when they exist there, they're available to every function. Um, this is a good thing. This is also a bad thing. Um, it's really easy to mess something up. If you change that variable in one function, it's going to change it for every other function that uses it. So um, the suggestion is to use this keyword const for constant to basically protect yourself from yourself um, so you don't make any changes to it. And we can take a look at that here. So this is just a, a program where I sent a set of uh, variable x equal to 2. I'm going to print out x is 2. Um, the sleep function actually just pauses for a second, for one second in this case. Um, I then have a function called times 2 that takes in the variable x here. Um, and this function you know, takes in x multiplies it by two, so, so x is going to be equal to x times two, prints out that value, and doesn't return anything, then goes back. So in this case, um, you'll see x is two, x is four, and then x is two here. So even though we use the same name for the variable, in both places, even though we passed it through, we didn't actually change the value of x up here. So x was 2 here. 2 gets sent through to the function. x then becomes 2 times 2 for 4. But we didn't return anything, so it doesn't change. Um, if, though, I take this out of here and move it up above, um, yep, I didn't remake it. Yep. What did I do? So declaration shadow is a variable. So this is actually, this, this is good. This is actually the compiler is protecting me from my own, you know, stupidity. 
Uh, I'm using the same variable name twice here, so I'm just going to change it to here. And hopefully that's enough to fix it. Yes. Um, so now that I have a global variable, that actually changed, right? So the global variable is accessed here to print it. It was passed to this function. Even though this function didn't return anything, I was able to set its value here, which sets it globally, and then it, it's uh, accessible here. So this is just why you kind of have to be careful, especially when you use sort of common variable names, i, x, things like that. Um, and you can, if you're, you want to protect yourself, add that const there. And then when I go to uh, make scope, it should yell at me here. So it says cannot assign to variable x with const qualified type const int. So this just says on line six, uh, I have defined this to be a const int equals to two. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't, here it says here, there it is, on line 19, I'm trying to change that value. And it's saying you can't do that. So that's uh, that's what helps there. So I'm going to change this back to how it was. Uh, you can all play with it later if you feel like. But I just want to make sure it's how it was. Uh, All right. Um, the other thing that you may see, and, and I actually saw in the the problem sets this week, and just wanted to to talk about it. There's sort of two ways to do this. Um, we have global variables, and then we have this uh, hash define keyword. So um, in bulbs.c, we had this const int bits in bytes equals eight. Um, if you looked at wordle.c, we had define list size 1000. So there's no equal sign here, uh, anything like that. So yeah, global variables can be used by any function in the program. This constant keyword, as I said, prevents you from making changes to it. Um, as we sort of talked about in that very first slide where we talked about compiling, anything with this hash symbol in front of it is a preprocessor directive. And in this case, define basically says anytime you see this uh, word list size, when we go to compile it, replace it with this value here. So we can use this anywhere, just like exact or close or wrong. But when we go to actually compile it, it's going to replace exact with two, close with one, wrong with zero. Um, so that you know lets us do the same thing in two different ways. Um, so I think these are these are functionally the same idea um, if you need to make globals. And um, for for global variables and especially like constant variables that aren't going to change, the convention is often to do them in uh, all capitals. Uh, and that sort of helps people recognize something that's not supposed to ever be changed. All right. Anything? Anything you want to talk about? I have a couple like problem set two hints here, but uh, other than that, there we go. Um, yeah. So I picked out some of the interesting functions that are going to be helpful uh, or may be helpful. Um, C type .h has this is alpha, is lower, is upper. Um, these are the functions that operate only on one character at a time. Uh, in standard lib.h, that a to i function um, could be helpful. Uh, in string.h, uh, strlang gets you the length of a string, and that's a nice shortcut. Um, there's some others, too. Um, just recall the, the modulo operator, basically the remainder after division. Um, that's going to be of use to you. And sort of an interesting quirk of C as a language, the 
characters and integers can sort of be interchanged. Um, in C, it's perfectly acceptable to say the character capital C minus the character capital A, and the answer will be two. Um, so, you know, that's kind of weird, but um, you can take advantage of that and do some, you know, some math with characters. Um, and then I sort of talked about filling an array from right to left where you'd actually start with I being some number larger than zero and then, you know, I being greater than equal to zero, you can do I minus minus and count down too. Um, yeah, I think the problems for PSET 2, you have a lot of choices uh, this week. Uh, my advice is, um, Sorry, the problem sets. Um, readability, get that done. Um, if you follow its instructions, it, it outlines very nicely to do things in steps. Um, don't try to do it all at once. You know, um, implement you know one little piece at a time, letters and then words and then sentences. And um, do this these little hint things here um expand i don't know if that's clear to everybody but that's very useful to know is saying like oh in c type.h you know here there's a there's a function there that you might find useful um so you know take a look at that and um also the walkthrough that brian uh does here is you know pretty helpful as well to just sort of watch this video and i know that when i watch these going through it i would often just like watch the video and for, you know, for a minute or 30 seconds, even just pause it and like have to stop and try to put it together and then restart it and go back. So that that's pretty normal. All right. Um, and then, yeah, as far as the other problems in problem set two, they are roughly in order of easiest to hardest. Uh, I say roughly, everybody maybe feels a little bit differently about that. But, um, you know, I would suggest starting with bulbs and, and checking that out, bulbs and or Caesar and doing that, and then uh, moving on uh, from there. And the Wordle one was not necessarily trivial. It has a lot of, lot of weird stuff going on. All right. That is everything I had that I wanted to talk to talk to you about um, this week. So um, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I am done. You are free to go. Uh, take care. But as usual, I'll stay and uh, answer questions as long as you'd like. Uh, thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Recording stopped. Yeah, uh, there's a question. Tech one. This one, the easier we have to. Uh, I'm sorry? This one, the about the problem set one, this one, the easier we have to choose. Yeah. So. Which, so uh, I'm having a hard time. Hearing you. I'm sorry. What was it? What was your question again? I'm sorry. About the problem set one, this one that is problem the easier set. we have to choose. From problem set one, it's one. We have to choose one, uh, five of uh, the bot or oh, no, no, problem set, problem, problem set, set two. two. I mean, two, okay, yeah, yeah. So, you find the easier you need to do readability, everybody needs to do that one, and then of these four, you need to submit at least one. So if yeah. you submit more than one, 
you don't get penalized at all. You basically get the highest score from any of them. So I suggest starting top to bottom, you know, bulbs first, then Caesar. Once you get Caesar, substitution should be similar to Caesar. And then the Wordle one is uh, a, probably the most challenging. Okay, thank you, Jess. Yep. Hey, Josh. Yeah. Uh, I have a question that uh, I tried to do it for the, my scribble. Uh, when I'm doing some step, there is a run already. But when I'm checking from the GS15, there is some red uh, things that uh, she, she said that I cannot be run this program. But actually, when I try, it is the, 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 the answer is correct. Yeah, I might have to actually see your specific implementation um, just to go to figure out what's happening. So I'm sorry, I can, I can go through. I'm happy to go through. Um, uh, so I can share. Here. I did this. Um, yeah, let's let's not share yours in the whole group. Um, maybe take a look at it some other time. You can either email me or post to the ed board and I'll, I'll take a look at it there. Okay, maybe I will share it tomorrow with the okay. office hour. Great, that'd okay. be great. Okay, see you um, tomorrow. I, yeah. I, I, will, I will meet you tomorrow in the office hour. Okay. Um, so in, in this implementation, um, I, I think it basically tells you this, you have to do this part. This should be relatively straightforward for you. Uh, if this score is, you know, score one is greater than two, player one wins. Um, else, if score one is less than score two, print player two wins. Else, print tie. So if if you either have greater than, less than, and if you haven't done one of those, the only choice left is equal. So that's tie. Um, and then for the compute score function. Um, Basically, I, I just implement it as here's an integer called score. I'm going to start it at zero. And then for int i equals zero, the length is sterling word. Um, i less than length, basically loop through every letter of it. I'm just going to ask if the word is uppercase. So this is it up. I'm oh, sorry, the character is uppercase. I'm going to, you know, take that uh, that value and subtract a from it. And again, this is sort of a weird thing. I'm going to take, you know, the character a and a minus a would give me zero. B minus a would give me one. But that works really well because now I can go into this points array up here where this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, A, B, C, D, on and on. Um, so this lets me calculate the spot in the array. This lets me get the number in the array. And then I can add it to the score. And then I can say, else, if that character is lowercase, we're just going to subtract little a. Um, and then I'm saying here, I don't I have an if and an else if I don't have an else. And that's just because like, if it's not uppercase or lowercase, I want to ignore it and just do nothing. Um, so that was my implementation. I think, you know, there's, uh, you know, you could make this maybe a little uh, shorter. I could just do something like, let me think. So I was thinking like this is is upper is lower. I could maybe convert them all to uppercase first. I could say like two upper and then just do this. But I don't want to mess anything up if it's a like a non-letter character that gets put through there. So I think this works. There's there's definitely other ways to solve this uh, problem, but that's that's how I got through it.
All right. Anybody want to other questions? Any other problems we're running into? Oh, uh, there we go. Um, Udi. Did you have a question? Uh, okay, thank you, Sir Josh. Yeah. Uh, in this session, uh, honestly, I feel a little confused, but in <laughs> other side, I feel blessed because I uh, had new knowledge. Uh, when you type in your terminal windows with a new uh, code, uh, would you explain what uh, code you it for, like uh, dot slash scope, or uh, when you say about one algorithm? Mm -hmm. uh, so what? Uh, would you explain what a function of class, uh, dot slash scope? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yes. in this folder in this directory, I have a whole bunch of different files. Um, so if we're talking about scope, I have scope.c, which is here. Um, and just a sort of weird quirk of how um, Linux as an operating system works is when we want to run something, if I just type scope, it's going to basically look in a set of system folders for a program called scope. And this is why when I type ls, I can just type ls by itself and uh, not you know, have to do dot slash ls. Uh, that won't work. Um, what I'm telling it when I say dot slash is dot means this directory. So I'm saying in this directory, there is a program called scope, and you should run that program. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I think this uh, syntax is a uh, name of a uh, program, yes? Yes. So you say in this folder, dot slash, there's a program called scope, okay. run that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Question in the chat. Um, yeah, so there's a question about counting characters without spaces. So how um, count characters. So in the manual pages here, in ctype.h, there's a function here that checks whether a character is alphabetical. And so this means, you know, lowercase a through z, uppercase a through z. So uh, if it's a letter, it's going to return true. If it is not a letter, it's going to be false. So that's probably what you want to use for uh, counting characters. Um, you know, there's other things here that you could use. Potentially, there is space for white space um, that you might find useful later. Um, Stuff like that. So alphanumerical here, alnum would mean a letter or a number. Alpha is just letters, and then is digit is just numbers. So, and actually, I think alphanumeric will also accept like minus sign and a decimal point as well, but I'm not 100% sure on that. No, I guess not for this implementation. It's just alphanumeric or digit. Yeah, so that might work. Loop through everything, check if it's a letter, add to your count. All right, anything else? Uh, Mr. Josh. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. Um, I see that the 
uh, time to finish the P, uh, problem set two is quite long. My, uh, my question is, um, will the uh, week three release on this coming Sunday or the next next Sunday? Um, uh, I mean, after the, usually yeah. uh, the, what is it? The deadline with the a new week uh, is not really. Yeah, so uh, this one, this problem yeah. set, you, it looks like our, you know, it's week, quite long. week two is actually a bit longer. And yeah. so problem set three will, it says it's going, this is, this is all in my time. So uh, okay, okay, I'm okay, sorry. Okay, okay. Okay. So it's for you, this is, it's going to release you no know, Sunday the 13th, you know, at noon or something like that. Um, so I'm sorry that we have such weird time differences. Yeah, on. I got it. Sorry, I didn't um, check this one. Yep. But then so this we one have you'll also really two have, weeks. So there's, I think, two weeks for this one and two weeks for this one. And it looks like two weeks for this one. Ah, okay. Which is good it's because really, that's, yeah, which that's is usually really good. one yeah. that that people yeah, need. Yeah, I'm yeah. gonna, I'm going to sneakily look through here. P set four is good. P set three. P set five is one that people often find takes a long time. So that's um, that's the one you'll have all basically. You know, from December 11th through, you know, to January 2nd. Um, so that's, yeah, Th these do get spread out nicely. Um, I can tell okay. you for problem set six in Python, um, one of the first, the first half of the problem set is you are going to redo, redo every problem from problem set one, two, and three, I think. And using Python. And you'll be just angry at how easy it was to do <laughs> them. <laughs> um, so P set six, um, you redo cash credit, hello, Mario, and readability. So just from one and two. And when we get to Python, I I the thing that I usually make people angry not angry but like they're like oh why didn't we learn this is that p set five we implement basically a a spell checker and it's going to take you so long to do and it when we do it in python i can literally write the entire program in two minutes um so it's it's really interesting to thank you, to, thank to you Mr. see Just. the difference yep yeah it's um, really really amazing. There's a question about the minimum score for each P set lab. I mean, the actual minimum is zero, like if you don't do it, but I mean, you mean like the minimum, <laughs> sorry, I don't know, like the minimum passing score or the, I, I don't have a good idea about what a passing score is because we don't really work like that with grades. Um, yeah, I, I don't know, you know, just do your best. Um, you know, style will always get you at least some points. So even if you turned in uh, Hello World over and over again, you would get something uh, just if it was styled well. So uh, yeah, I, I really don't know. I don't have a good concept of what, what it is. But we're not looking for perfect scores every time. That's just sort of, you know, a benchmark. Do the best. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. No. So if you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you only need to do one, but if you submit more than one, it's not going to 
penalize you if you get something wrong. Basically, they'll take the highest score out of those four and use that for your grade. So this is why, you know, I would definitely try to do bulbs first. That was relatively easy for me, at least. Um, Caesar, I also thought was not too bad. Um, and then these later two are, are definitely a bit harder. You don't get extra for it, um, but you don't get you don't get penalized if you don't get full credit either. So just yes. just like on on problem set one, um, you know where you had you had to do hello, you had to do at least uh -huh. one Mario and at least one of cash or credit. So yeah, a lot of people don't do credit. That that's uh, that's a tough one. Yep. And at some point, I think we'll post answers for these. Excuse me. I don't know when. Um, if you ever do want to go over answers or review your answers with somebody, I'm, I'm happy to, to meet with you and do that or, or take a look at your code offline and provide feedback. Just, just let me know. All right. Well, I will let you get on with your day. Um, have fun with the problems. You know, use, use all that uh, extra time and uh, try not to get too frustrated. Reach out for help. Um, a lot of people responding to stuff on Ed, that's great, or, or uh, send emails as usual. Oh yeah, there's a uh, somebody asked about the graphic, the difficulty. Yeah, uh, let me find it. Yeah. Thank you. That's what it is. Here, this is the graph here. So two, three people seem to find roughly about the same as two, four goes up. Five was less. I thought five. Let me hold on. Five is smaller. I guess four. You have two problems to do. Five. There's only one problem to do, but it's it's bigger. So maybe that's why it goes back down. Uh, six is you know it gets easy for a little bit easier for a little bit here, and then the last couple are going to be uh, more difficult again because when we get to piece at nine, you're going to be writing in two different programming languages and scripting languages too. So four, four total languages. So, yeah. Which seems scary, at least if you've never written code before. That like at the end, you're gonna be doing projects that incorporate, yeah, four different languages, but it should work. So seven is, yeah, is SQL. And then eight is going to be like HTML. Uh, I don't remember what else. And then nine is going to be putting it all together. And nine is usually good practice for like final projects and stuff like that too. Oh uh, yeah, there, sorry, there's a hand, I didn't, didn't notice, sorry.
question? Saya bujut. Yes, uh, Mr. Jess, I'm so sorry. Uh, you said that we will make the hello in Python, right? Or yes. something else? Yeah, uh, all of the program will be uh, on Python. Uh, what do you think? If I didn't make the credit, so I cannot make uh, the credit to in Python. Or uh, Python will be... Uh, we have to make the all of the program on uh, PSET 1, PSET 2, and for the other I in think Python. It, you basically have to do the same thing. Thank so you. you have to do hello... You have to do one of the Mario's, you have to do one of cash or credit, and then readability. And I don't even know if I didn't do them yet. That's good. I'll, I'll do my homework too, I promise. Right, I'm just gonna do it now. Okay. Sorry. Done. There's hello in Python. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it gets, and then there's, you know, that's half of the problems that the other one is this um, DNA problem here. But a few weeks ahead, that'll be, I guess, in the, in the new year. Yeah, Python will be, yeah, wrap the year up. All right, anything else? Thank you, Thank yeah. You. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Mr. John. Thank you very See much, you Mr. John. Talk to you in two weeks, I guess. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Josh. Yeah. Thank you, Josh. Reset sembilan. Ngabisin empat belas jam ya. Yang kagro. Orang liburan Sini New Year, lah. we we ngerjain pisat sik. Dua minggu, dua minggu ke depan. Recording in progress. Yeah. Recording stopped.